Okay, well basically, like I started off a moment ago, to pique your interest, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to the end of the talk and tell you what I do when I go to court. The very first thing I do with the court, before I even enter the court, I suspend the judge. The judge may not make any decisions whatsoever. He cannot make a decision against me. He cannot make a decision for me. If he makes a decision against me, I'll issue a court order vacating his decision. If he makes a decision for me, I'll issue a court order vacating his decision. If I like the decision, I'll issue another order granting it. But I do not let the judge make any decisions at all, not one, okay? Not on his own. <coughs> there is one case, and that case is on this CD, where the judge didn't get the message. And he issued a second decision after I had vacated his first decision. And by the way, when I vacate a decision, I don't just do like judges do and issue orders. What I do is I have an introduction to the order, which is a small course in, in law for the judge to read. I don't care about the attorneys. But the, I, it's written for the judge. It's written on his level. And it educates him as to why it is that I'm number one and he's number two. Then I give him the order. Okay, he gets it as a package. Now there was one judge who didn't get the message. So what I did was I fined him for contempt of court. Okay? The founding fathers really understood abuse of power. They had it up to their eyeballs with Mr. King. The old King George up there. He really was having a good time with all his uh, military coming over and harassing us, killing our people, raping them, robbing them, and not getting convicted, not punishing his soldiers. We had it. I mean, and if you want to understand the situation, just go back and read the Declaration of Independence. That's a wonderful statement of what the problem was about and why we reacted to King George. We didn't want to leave the king. We were very loyal as a people. But there were the abuses. The Founding Fathers understood this. Well, they didn't really understand it. They first tried the uh, Confederacy. That didn't really work so well. So the Constitution was a second attempt at it. Now, in my opinion, the, the Constitution is one of the finest documents ever, ever created. But it's being ignored. And you see problems around you today, in my opinion, they're not because of the Constitution, they're because the Constitution is being ignored. And why is it being ignored? Because ignorance is rampant now. They do not teach civics in school anymore. The very first school that was mandatory, public school, the very first mandatory public school was populated under military supervision. The children were escorted to the school against the parents' wishes by the military. Not the police, but the military. Now, why was it so important for the federal government or whatever government was that brought the soldiers out? Why was it so important for them to go to that extreme, which basically was illegal, unconstitutional? Well, because the key to population control is mindset. And they had to get them in. From the 1850s to the 1950s, they gradually stripped out the subject of civics and replaced it with a new subject called American government. Has anybody seen that in school? Okay, what's the difference? Civics, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says something to the effect that is that branch of political philosophy that concerns personal rights. It does not concern government. It concerns personal rights. They quit teaching that. <clears throat> now, I want you to understand, when the Constitution was formed, or actually when we declared our independence in 1776, we were not an uncultured, boorish bunch of people. We were not a bunch of backwoodsmen. That's what they like to tell us. 
they like to leave us with the impression that uh, you know we're just a bunch of uh, I guess you know random people that decided to rebel just to put it in perspective I want you to realize that in 1776 Harvard University was over 100 years old okay we were a cultured society we had our customs we had our usages we were equal to England in terms of our development they like to tell us that the United States is over 200 years old well when you talk of the culture here we're over 400 years old we were established and out of those experiences we developed the Constitution who are who do I mean by we I mean we the people okay so anyway let's get into this <clears throat> on this CD this CD is law notes and that's just what it is this is not a complete CD it just has some notes that I've accumulated over time um, on the on the cover page here you'll see there's law notes and there's the example the law notes that's the theory the example is an actual case where the theory got applied okay so this case involved um, an automobile going through a stop sign and injuring a rider on a bicycle and it resulted in uh, I don't know fifty thousand dollars or seventy five thousand dollars in surgery plus a lot of ongoing treatments interesting feature of the uh, of the uh, vehicle code and that is that if the driver is under is a minor and has a driver's license uh, with the okay of the parents then any accident that that minor gets into the liability is limited to fifteen thousand dollars who do you think pays the rest the victim the victim it also says that the parents are limited to fifteen thousand liability and on top of that the aggregate total of the liability of both the child and the parent is fifteen thousand dollars so the bottom line is fifteen thousand dollars that's your limit victim pays the rest that's how the statutory system seems to work well this is common law under common law we have a little different approach under common law we look at this and we say well one of the principles of common law is there shall not be no remedy there must be a remedy for an, every injury so if there isn't a remedy we can make up a remedy okay that's one of the principles also it's a it's an established principle in case law that the state of California or any government is not responsible for what happens among the people okay or the citizens they're not really responsible as long as they just pass the rules but don't participate okay so the legislature makes up the rules we call them statutes and codes but they're not responsible they hold no liability for those rules okay each and every citizen is responsible for his own behavior okay and uh, the state's not responsible however if the state jumps in and participates then the state assumes a liability well take a look at this here's the vehicle code that's a set of rules fine now do we have driver education programs do we have quality control experts out there called traffic cops okay do we have a number of administrative things so what we said is well plus we have one more factor and that is that this individual called the state of California is a third party intervener we don't care how much the uh, child and parent are protected by the third party intervener if the third party intervener is willing to cover the cost cover the, the liability right it's only fair I mean your common gut feel tells you that's fair 
So that's what the common law is all about. Common law is common sense. It really is. What is common law? It's public opinion. What do all of you think? What would you think if you were on a jury in a common law case before you and somebody said apply common sense? That would make sense. So that's what we sued him on. This case is ongoing. We have yet to write the final judgment. We're almost there. Actually, we are there. We just have to write it. So what you have here is everything except the final judgment. But you don't need the final judgment because all the principles are on this CD. Okay? I'd like to point out something else. Many years ago, there was a fellow named Cicero. And this is on the CD. I just, I'm not going to hunt for it right now, but it's on there. Cicero said that a few men live by reason. Most live by experience. The remainder live by necessity. And the animals live by nature. Now what he's saying here, let's start at the top. Most men, I mean a few men, live by reason. What this means is that you look at something. Here's A, here's B, and out of the A and B you conclude this is C. Okay? You hear a noise on the roof. And you conclude without looking out the window that it's raining. Okay? You draw your conclusions from the facts that are before you. This approach that I'm using requires you to think. Don't ask me for an example. I already gave you one. It's called example. So when you go looking through this stuff, you're going to have to be on top of it. There's a real simple rule of law that sometimes we forget. And what it is, it's actually a maxim of law. And what it says is that the law does not protect he who slumbers on his rights. Okay? The law is not going to go out and see if you're in trouble and protect you. Now, if you don't have the intellectual power, then you're considered to be one of those who's slumbering on his rights. The law won't protect a person who's dumb. So, you'll have to... I don't know who's smart and who's dumb, but I'll tell you this. If you use this approach, you're going to have to be on top of it. You're going to have to be able to reason your way through because if you don't apply your reasoning powers, then it won't work. They'll pull a quickie on you and you won't figure it out. The very first time I ever issued a court order was really interesting. The guy was in jail and he asked me to help out and I was just fresh studying this stuff. But I had formed some ideas. So he understood sovereignty and he, had, he was careful to guard his position. So the municipal court had him and in jail and so he moved for habeas corpus in the superior court. Superior court rubber stamped a no on it. So he made a second motion for habeas corpus. They said no again. So then what he did, he, that, it was after that that I got involved. And he said, um, he understood the sovereignty. So what we talked about it, and what we had him do is appoint me as a special master in his court. Now a special master has any power that the sovereign will allocate to him. There's no limit on a, on a magistrate, or a special master, I mean, if the sovereign grants it to him. So in this case, he granted me the power to uh, take uh, depositions, to investigate, and do a whole bunch of other stuff, and to hold hearings, okay? So while I was working on the case, we heard a rumor, jailhouse rumor, that they were going to pre uh, bring his case up on the following uh, Monday. So that Monday, I dressed up like an attorney. I had a pinstripe suit and tie. I looked very much like an attorney. <clears throat> and I got there early and I managed to wangle an audience with the judge. Went into the judge's chambers. And I said to the judge, I said, I've been appointed as a special master in the Superior Court. And by the way, I had it filed and I had a certified copy in my hand. 
and uh